good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm moderating the first session of the, this workshop. English is no, not my first language, so bear with me. I'm Santosh Sikdel from Nepal. I'm co-chair of this uh, dynamic coalition on internet rights and principle and executive director of Digital Rights Nepal. So this is a dynamic coalition session a uh, workshop on human rights law and the global digital compact. And in this session, uh, the agenda of the session is uh, we'll be discussing briefly about the uh, work of the IRPC, sharing about the dynamic coalition. After that, we'll be discussing about the briefly about the digital global compact and the human rights. And after that, there will be short speeches from three of the experts. Can you change? Uh, three of the experts, and after that there will be a group session where we'll be navigating the current human rights challenges or the challenges we might face up to till in next 10 years and how digital global digital compact can be used as a tool to navigate those challenges in the online spaces. And uh, there will be some recommendation from the, for the stakeholders uh, from our side to address those challenges that we foresee through the, our group exercise. So that is the outline of the outline of the this workshop. And uh, regarding the uh, this dynamic coalition, we started it in 2008. And it is an open network of individual and organization uh, who are making human rights effective in the online space. And uh, this is an open, uh, open coalition. Anybody can join the coalition by subscribing to the email. And uh, uh, our website for, the, for this coalition is internetrightsandprincipal.org. And since 2014, uh, the IRPC coalition is al also the steering committee member of the Media and Information Society at the Council of Europe. Um, the, the charter of the, the coalition, one of the major outcome of the dynamic coalition is the human rights uh, charter uh, and principles. Uh, the 10 internet right, uh, rights uh, principle and char the charter of the rights and principle. And it was published in 2018 and uh, one of the major, our work is translation, uh, making it available in different languages. And so far the charter has been translated into 12 languages and uh, it, is, uh, the, uh, uh, it is available in uh, 28 languages. Uh, the, uh, the charter, uh, the principles are available in 28 languages. Through the charter, we engage with the stakeholder in uh, regional level at the, at the same time at the national level, country level. And we also collaborate with other dynamic coalition and we engage with the stakeholder, for example, National Human Rights Commission in different countries. At the same time, uh, we also uh, raise the awareness about the need of implementing the right-based approach while developing and implementing internet framework in, uh, in country level. So uh, we have been, the translation work is kind of voluntary approach. So there is no uh, dedicated support or funding for that. So we collaborate with the other organization and volunteers for different countries. And uh, Dennis would be sharing about the Japanese charter uh, that we recently, last year we had uh, translated the charter into Nepali and we had launched it in the IGF Ethiopia in Addis. Uh, this year we have translated uh, uh, the charter into Japanese language and he, we have got copy of the charter in Japanese as well. So Dennis would be talking about the Japanese translation in a while. But before that, uh, I'll be sharing about the work that the DC Dynamic Coalition carried out this year in 2023. So uh, the Dynamic Coalition participated, uh, officially presented at the Eurodig in Finland. Similarly, in Africa, we participated in the Ghana SIG and presented the, the charter. Uh, there was a UNESCO conference on platform accountability, a sorry, guideline for the social media governance in France where we participated and presented the charter. Similarly, there was a similar event in Nepal where uh, uh, we participated, I represented IRPC at that time. Uh, we also engaged this year with the National Human Rights Commission of Nepal and uh, advocated for the implementation of the charter in the, in the local context and uh, emphasizing their role, role of the National Human Rights Commission. 
Similarly, we audited our website for the accessibility approach, and we improved the accessibility of the IRPC website this year. Uh, similarly, in IGF earlier, we co-organized the uh, Global Digital Compact Southern Perspective Workshop. Uh, and similarly, the work of this year, the Japanese translation of the charter, which Dennis would be further explaining about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Santosh. Um, indeed, um, today, uh, and on occasion of the IGF in Japan, we're uh, launching the uh, Japanese translation of the Ten Principles document. Uh, this is the short version, if you will, of the of the charter. The charter is a document of 25 plus pages. Um, that obviously is a is much bigger effort. Um, this Ten Principles document, we um, got help uh, translating. Uh, for this conference, and this conference also is the place um, where we hope that we can uh, garner th some more interest uh, in the charter among uh, Japanese stakeholders in order to um, get more engagement of our coalition uh, with the people in Japan. Uh, and so if you are, if you know someone, if you yourself a Japanese speaker, um, feel free to join a task force we're setting up uh, to translate um, the charter in its entirety. As we said, we now have 12 different translations of the charter. It would be great to have a 13th soon, um, and, and, and that be a Japanese version. Uh, this is teamwork. Uh, it's not that much time commitment. Uh, we look for people who have a grasp of internet governance or of international law, ideally both. And um, you can contact me, uh, you know, if you're here in the room, uh, contact me, write me a personal message. If you're online, we're happy to engage. Uh, and we hope to uh, launch this then at a Japan IGF or an Asia Pacific Regional IGF or the IGF uh, uh, next year. And that's already it with the updates from the coalition. Thank you for listening. Uh, we'll distribute those after the session or in between, so you can take a flyer home if you want. Um, there's also the website um, on there. Uh, thank you, Dennis, for the update. So this was the initial opening of the workshop where we are describing about the decision and our work. So we are now entering into the main part of the uh, session, talking about the human rights law and global digital compact. So in this uh, in this main session, there will be three speakers talking about the different uh, different dimension of the digital. Uh, global Digital Compact and Human Rights Law. So to open the session, uh, I request co-chair of the Dynamic Coalition, Rasi. Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm also moderating the session, so I'm going to talk a little bit lightly about the GDC and just uh, give everyone an overview of the events that have happened, uh, how we've participated, and then, of course, uh, give it to... Helani and Dennis uh, to move forward with our program. So uh, the GDC um, was agreed upon in the summit of the future, uh, looking at the roadmap recommendations of digital corporations uh, with uh, United Nations, uh, governments, um, civil society, and, and uh, looking at a more multi-stakeholder uh, digital technology track. Um, we've seen this also in a lot of conversations where the SDGs are very technology uh, avoidant, uh, so maybe this uh, perhaps is a good gap to, um, I mean, at least we look at it as a way to uh, fill it up. Um, and then there was a, uh, there was also a decision uh, held at the UN uh, General Assembly that was held on the 22nd um, and 23rd uh, of September, which uh, would look at uh, opening for comments uh, on uh, on you know collecting inputs from interested stakeholders that were considered with GDC. Um, we also have uh, Sweden and Rwanda that are looking as appointing as co-facilitators uh, into this process, uh, looking at roadmaps. And from an IRPC point of view, uh, some of the topics that uh, interest us is, of course, uh, the topic of digital inclusion and connectivity. Um, and of course, uh, we we have um, you know a few topics in our charter where it directly goes into um, addressing digital inclusion gaps that are faced by women um, and migrants and refugees, uh, more looking at marginalized groups and how uh, digital inclusion uh, can also foster and include uh, public participation, uh, political participation, and how um, involving these groups in digital policy making processes uh, is important. 
Uh, we also look at uh, the point of human rights online, where how can we equate that the same rights that people have offline are also seen online, uh, looking at cross-cutting uh, issues on freedom of expression, um, information, net neutrality, um, and of course, also looking at promoting multilingualism and promotion of cultural diversity, um, and also looking strongly at children's rights and how they should have agency and looking at ensuring that there is protection of privacy. Um, there's also one on digital trust and safety, um, looking at uh, artificial intelligence being an integral component um, on how uh, the pervasive influence on how it could include um, and influence uh, financial services and how one should have agency on knowing whether AI is used um, in, in the process of, for example, in recruiting, um, in the public health sector, and looking at the ramifications of AI on driving economic growth, uh, but looking at it from a privacy concern, um, safety concern, security concern, uh, with the invent of uh, synthetic media, deep fakes, uh, but yeah, AI also looking at an advanced technology that uh, could uh, look at examples that are more triggering uh, for regulation, having more policy discussions, but of course, um, just giving you a little overview and then can have um, Helani join in. Okay. Um, right, as, as a sort of a last minute addition to this panel, um, I'm gonna be, um, look, I, I think the GDC in its sort of current policy draft, whatever, which is really the only document we have to go on, along with everything that was said in the various different consultations. Um, I think it re does a good job of referring repeatedly to human rights. Uh, it also refers to ongoing instruments, sort of, you know, like guiding principles on business and, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it doesn't try to create a new set of rights. I think, you know, that's as it should be. There's a lot about misinformation and curbing of that, putting responsibility of platforms, and then also about artificial intelligence. So there's a huge focus on Article 19, specifically on rights. Uh, I think what it doesn't do, and there's time to do that, is really think about how those mechanisms are actually going to be implemented, right? Like even the guiding principles on business and, you know, uh, and human rights. These are not binding. These are, you know, voluntary sign-up things. So I'm not quite sure how that process is, and there has been very little visibility on that. So I think that's kind of important. One of the critiques I made yesterday in a, uh, in a session that uh, Ambassador Gill was there as well was that uh, there has so far been very little really to bring the different communities together because we've been, civil society consultations have been in one side, the businesses have been talking, you know, separately amongst themselves, et cetera. And somehow this synthesized document in its current draft is out but really it's the interaction of these different various stakeholder groups that I think has to be facilitated. Uh, but I find a fundamental structural issue in that private companies are not the only violators of human rights, and in fact state and state mechanisms are a huge violator, and in setting this as much as it gives way to multi-stakeholder consultation, it's still set within a multilateral system where nation states are the primary voting base when it comes to key decisions. Uh, and, they are comp and that system is completely unable to hold rogue nations to account. Um, people who hinder tax negotiations because they are the biggest earners in terms of tax when it comes to the platform economy. People who filter the internet for billions of people and don't let their citizens you know, browse what they like or say what they like. People who shut down the internet under the flimsiest of excuses. There is no mechanism to hold nations to account. Uh, I mean, this is a, just a feature of the multilateral system, not of the GDC, by the way, right? But I think that's a real fundamental shortfall and we really do need, really need to think about this. There's no point talking about human rights when wars are going on 
and there's no mechanism to really intervene. So what are we talking about, the internet? Um, I think the other issue is that human rights are viewed as sort of this, almost this exotic set of rights without really embedding them in the other important set of rights, which are socioeconomic rights, and they're incredibly intertwined. The GDC talks about the need for connectivity almost as if it's like a one zero, you have connectivity, but it's going to be a moving, you know, sort of a continuum. And the kind of human rights you can en uh, engage in are really dependent on the kind of socioeconomic power you have, and the internet is vital to that, right? So they're really interconnected. So I don't think, you know, it really helps today to talk about these two things, the socioeconomic rights versus human rights, as if one is more important than the other. They're so intertwined and quite important. There's also, I think my last point, is that the GDC is going on in this process, and in a way quite removed from what's really happening on the ground, because while this conversation is going on and everyone is waiting for the summit of the future, What's really going on, for example, in South Asia, is that everyone is coming up with laws and regulations that really fundamentally hinder rights. Um, a recent example would be the proposed online safety bill. It's called the online safety bill. It's a speech moderation bill in Sri Lanka, right? We can cite many, many examples. Now, we have no idea how these two parallel systems are going to, you know, the GDC envisions this, you know, rights-based, human-centric world, and yet the underlying layer of laws, which are rushing, by the way, because, you know, everyone is pushing for these. They should be done. But they are completely, you know, removed from any of that GDC discussions and the vision we have for the future. So we're already going to have a whole set of laws that violate, we already have, and the new ones are also going to violate, you know, speech and many other rights, and that connection sort of is not really made, and I find that problematic, so thank you. Is someone, someone's online, or do you want me to comment? Is someone online, or do I give them the floor for that? Who is online? You should call out their name. I think they need to unmute themselves. Okay, so who? Oh, no, I, I think Wolf is on mute. Wolf, yeah. Okay, Wolf. Um, yeah, we'll have Wolfgang next. Uh, you can go first. Oh, if, if Wolfgang is not ready, I can actually see now. Sorry about that. Wolfgang, are you online? Okay, you can go ahead. Okay, Dennis, go ahead. I think it, I think it actually fits quite well here. Um, now, is the um, academic um, University of Bremen, Dennis Redeker, University of Bremen, speaking now? Um, but but really trying, I'm tr really trying to to focus and to uh, to focus my my talk and the things I brought um, on this question of of who are the potential human rights violators, anyways. Um, and and you mentioned. Um, Elena, you mentioned states as, as one of the, the, the main sources, potentially. So it's not just companies, obviously. Um, and what I do when I do research, I ask people about um, their opinions um, across the world, largely in, in the global south and um, eastern Europe. So I'm presenting some results here that I think are quite interesting for, for those who care about the global digital compact um, consultations and the process. Um, and then they relate, I think, to also what maybe people in these countries think about their governments with relation to uh, making good rules on a global level and their government's influence on processes at the UN level uh, in this field. Now, it's a very big challenge for someone who does public opinion research to um, actually ask the general population about the Global Digital Compact because what have they, what have average internet users that I ask um, in terms of knowledge on the on the consultations and on the process, it's very difficult. It's a technical process. Uh, most people will not be very attuned to the topics of uh, global um, internet and digital governance. Um, so I asked easier questions. I asked people, in your opinion, um, who should provide the input into writing of the Global Digital Compact? And this is now um, explained to people who responded to the survey what the GTC in general is, and then asked them, okay, so if that makes new rules on a global level for digital technologies and so on, um, who should have an influence on, these, uh, on, on, on the Global Digital Compact? And then I also asked them, in reality, who do you think actually has 
an influence in, uh, in the process. Um, and then lastly, I also asked them, so which are the principles, if you have to, in a very abstract way, have to think about the principles that you care most about, which of those do you want to be seeing as affirmed um, in the Global Digital Compact? Uh, the survey I ran um, with a couple of colleagues, uh, among them here are actually Faye Kohaus, I want to point you out, one of the research assistants, collaborators here in the room. Um, this is a web-based survey asking internet users about their opinions, um, recruitment among social media users, um, the ads that were put out for this were seen by 31.4 million users, um, it was a qu quota sampling uh, conducted. Uh, in total, 41 countries, six languages, uh, last year, early this year, and 17,500 people responded. And I asked them, okay, so who do you think um, the UN should listen to um, when it listens to different stakeholders? You can't necessarily read it when you're in the room here, so I'm gonna read it out. The very left bar, um, about 60%, is um, technical experts. So internet users think that technical experts have, should have the most influence on shaping the GDC. Secondly, academics, with about 50%. 45% um, of the citizens think that citizens should, have, should be heard by the UN uh, in the process. Obviously, in the consultations, there were opportunities like that. Um, then civil society at about 40 uh, for plus percent of the, of the uh, respondents. And national governments, interestingly, although they seem to have a great deal of impact on the, on the GDC, obviously, um, only 35% um, of the respondents thought they should be listened to um, and give input. Businesses, even less so. This is even more, perhaps even more interesting. About 18% or so of respondents think that they should be heard on the Global Digital Compact. And I also asked them, okay, so this is what you want, but what do you think actually happens? Well, they think technical experts, they're being listened to, no question about that. Uh, academics, they're not listened to enough, and I obviously agree. Um, citizens are not listened to, that's what they think in comparison to what they think, you know, how it should be. Uh, NGOs, a little bit less than there should be. Um, national governments are not being listened to. This is what the people out there think. I mean, this is 17,500 people, so it's, uh, you know, I'm, uh, they, they might be wrong, they're certainly wrong. Not right, I think, but um, but this is the perception. This is the idea what people have when you ask them. Um, these are it's a general population, uh, and people think that businesses, although they shouldn't be listened to, they're actually more listened to um, than they should be. So, so this uh, this is I think quite quite telling about about this question, and and may actually tell you something about what, and this is connecting to the previous um, talk what people think about who might be risks for human right-based um, digital governance. It might be the companies, it might be the states, but not the others, and so please let the others have an influence on this. Um, and then I also asked the question, so this is a very, the, the topics of the GDC are very complex. You can't really ask, like, how should the text be in the end? Um, please write it down. So, so I asked people about core principles. I uh, selected some, and I asked them about all these principles and ask them whether they agree that is a principle that should definitely be included. Um, security of children online tops the list. Most people, more, more than 70% of the respondents think that's very important, should be included. Security of privacy online, more than 60%. Uh, fighting hate speech online is quite up there on the list, but also protection of intellectual property. Um, but also greater cultural and linguistic diversity online. Network neutrality still makes the list kind of halfway. Uh, right to encryption of data, more innovation, less regulation of digital technology is rather in the, I think, last third of those. Open source software doesn't really feature up high, uh, neither does open data. Uh, and also those who say there should be no censorship online um, are only about 20 to 30 percent. This is probably also a result of conversation, I mean, what does no censorship mean, right? This also means no content moderation, essentially, if you will, of any kind. Um, I had only just one or two slides more, and this is a slide that says, uh, shows in which countries people um, tend to say there should be no censorship um, um, online. And these are um, primarily countries in, sorry, in Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Latin America, and not so much in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Northern Africa, and Southeast Asia. And those asked um, about um, cultural and uh, language um, 
uh, rights um, online. It's it's predominantly uh, very strong in in uh, around the African continent and somehow uh, some some places in Latin America. And uh, yeah, maybe that's just the data, but I think it's insightful for us to to think about. Um, the, the bottom-up view we often talk about, so what, how are people affected, but I, I wanted to think about like how can we actually talk to people about the GDC and what they think about this in very abstract forms sometimes with these principles. That's not the same discussion necessarily, but also very concretely, who should be listened to, because that really is something if we know um, how things are um, going in reality and what people think, that should give us at least some, some thought. Um, and with that, I'm ending, and hopefully we have uh, Wolfgang online. So if you talk about me, I'm Wolfgang Benedek. I'm sitting in Austria, and uh, my regards to everybody. It's a pleasure to listen to you, to see you here. I was involved in the past uh, in drafting of the charter, so that's quite some time ago. And I'm very pleased uh, to see what progress has been made in the meantime with regard to the translations of the principles and of the charter itself. Um, but I have to say I'm not an expert of the GDC. I'm working on artificial intelligence and human rights at the moment. And uh, we have a network of academics, a uh, global network on the internet uh, um, and human rights in online. And um, in that respect, uh, I'm, I rather wanted to put the question, and this is uh, uh, to what extent uh, in this uh, global regulation, which I think is very much uh, needed, however, on a, a soft law basis, uh, we can expect uh, some progress uh, with regard uh, to the rights uh, uh, enshrined in our charter uh, and um, also with regard uh, to the question of implementation. But as I have listened to the presenters, uh, this actually seems to be the gap uh, that um, there is little on enforcement. That is not untypical for such situations when you need to get agreement. Uh, but still, uh, the question is, what is the value added uh, of the GTC in that respect? Thanks so much, Wolfgang. Um, and now I will hand it over to Santosh and Dennis for the activity, or do we have, or do we open it up for questions or comments from our audience? Yeah, we could do that. So we want. I wanted to check if anyone had any questions or comments. Oh, of course, when I just get up and give the mic, let me just go ahead. No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. And then everyone could raise their hand so that I could pass on the mic. Thank you very much. It's Vince Cerf. Uh, when I listen to human rights, which I think we all care a great deal about. I begin to wonder about human responsibilities, and I don't know whether we've ever had a charter that speaks to that, but it seems to me in the environment that we're in, uh, in the online world, that we really do have some shared responsibility in addition to asking for and expecting rights. And I don't know whether we've tried to articulate that, but uh, would you suppose it would be worth our time to try to uh, offer uh, what responsibilities we have as uh, consumers, users, and occupiers of this online space. Is there anyone else that has any comments or questions? You could just raise your hand. Anyone? Yeah, I'll give it a moment. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Pio from the uh, EU Coalition uh, on the Internet Governance uh, Steering Committee member. I have uh, I have been to the um, uh, Internet Coalition, and I have been uh, present about this chapter uh, during the webinar that was happened 
uh, that that was happened uh, in the ASEAN South Asian network. Uh, that that is uh, quite interesting. The thing is that uh, I'm curious about how we can engage at the this uh, dynamic coalition and how we can get involved and how do you have a plan to bring the young people to get involved in uh, updating chapter or maybe uh, translation part or something like that. That is what I would like to know. Maybe I can, yeah, I can respond to that. Um, the I, We're actually very open with partnerships. We do have a partnership even with, say, the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. Uh, a lot of those members also get transformed. I'm, I'm an example of that. I was a part of YCIG, and then I transitioned into being a steering committee member and then co-chair. Uh, we're very open to having those conversations. Um, the IRPC emailing list is also good for opportunities on how youth can participate. Um, and the IGF is a good place. There are different ways. Uh, one is, the, of course, the Internet Societies program but there are a lot of ways in which uh, the country hosts have their own programs on how youth can participate in different sessions um, in and contribute remotely uh, leading up to the event and even after, uh, whether it's a discussion paper or it's a policy proposal. Um, so I would say the world is your oyster, but uh, you can connect with us after the session and we can see how uh, we can partner together on the charter translation or anything else. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Maybe to add, we have some, uh, I mean, you also have worked on the uh, translation project. I'll give you the mic in a second. Just one other example. Um, it's often also university students that, that work um, on, on the charter. We had two universities in uh, Padua in, in Northeastern Italy and Salerno in, in Southern Italy. Um, to um, lecturers getting their students involved into the translation of the uh, of the charter. Um, this was headed by Eduardo Celeste, uh, Dublin City University, really trying to um, to see whether this is worthwhile, not obviously as a translation for Italians to read, but also at the same time for the students to, to think about what it means to translate um, a, a, an English language text um, into your own language. What does it mean in your context? Because often it's not just a translation that you can do with automated uh, translation services. Increasingly so, maybe. But it, but it really um, means trade-offs as you translate it in another language. It means that you have to understand what it does actually mean. There's a different term for, for hate speech, maybe, or something else. So you got to think about you know, these kind of things. Very uh, instructive for everyone, I think, who engages with uh, translations. But Santos, you have another example, right? Yeah, just to continue with what Dennis said, uh, we collaborated with the local NGO in the case of Nepal, Digital Rights Nepal. So it is necessary that the uh, local people having the grasp of local language are engaged rather than the machines in the local level because the human agency is also important because in the draft translation they can talk, uh, they can discuss it with the stakeholders. For example, I'll give you one example. There is no real term, real translation of the term governance in Nepali. When we talk about internet governance, the the real term, uh, real translation is not there. So we had to use internet governance in, Ro in Romanized way. Uh, because after a long discussion, we agreed that any other term would not sufficiently grasp the whole idea of governance. So we'll uh, continue with the internet governance. So it is necessary that uh, we work with the local community, local stakeholder. And that is not only the, uh, only the translation, because it is also the uh, uh, part of uh, building capacity of the local stakeholder because in the process of translating you are working with the language of the charter we are working with the uh, the concept of the charter so that also build the capacity of the local stakeholder that I felt personally I'm gonna try and address this issue of I think responsibility and I'm gonna give a very retail level answer I think responsibility lies with obviously all the different actors in the internet value chain. And I think consumers also do have it. I think back at the environmental protection movement. My mother's generation, it was very normal to go on trips, eat out of plastic wrappers, and just leave that stuff there. We no longer do that. We would never, you know, across the world, now we are much more conscious about it. That's a responsibility act that has been grilled into us through 
primary education almost maybe, right? And the global conversation. Uh, it's also been matched with sort of incentives for good behavior, right? So I think that's a big part about it. And maybe sometimes punishment, the other side of incentives, right? Right? So um, I do think there is a responsibility. The, the danger of only having the responsibility conversation is that it puts the responsibility only on individuals. And the language is, you know, women should safeguard yourself on the internet. That's not the responsibility conversation, right? We have a civic responsibility because what we say and do on the internet, unless it's on a one-on-one -on -one message, it usually has externalities. There's a broadcast function. Our ideas permeate to people who unintentionally come across it. So there is absolutely an externality and a responsibility. And I think we need to start very much for retail individuals with um, uh, sort of young people and how we teach them on what civic behavior online is. So. Can I just add something to that? So I just wanted to relate with uh, the ongoing discourse around the regulation of misinformation, disinformation around the countries. And we have seen in some cases in the context of South Asia, including in Nepal, where the government is trying to impose this concept of responsibility towards the citizen that you have to filter the uh, uh, conversation or the, your expression on the internet to make sure that there is no p propagation of the fake news, so-called fake news or the misinformation or disinformation. So now, based on that responsibility, they want to frame a law or the legal regime where they can also uh, kind of, rip, uh, they can also control the legitimate expression uh, so sometimes this responsibility argument is uh, from the point of controlling the internet. That, uh, it is coming from that point of view also. I think we, sh we should also consider that. Maybe we could move to our activity. Uh, my, oh, we have to, oh, you have to. It's Vince Zerf again. Yeah, just thinking a little bit about a, an important document by Rousseau called The Social Contract. And in some sense, we agree to give up certain rights in exchange for safety and security, for example. In, in different countries, uh, we will choose to give up more or less, uh, depending on what we're comfortable with. There are other things that we call norms, and those are um, not exactly responsibilities. They are uh, behavior patterns that the society generally teaches us we should uh, adopt, but there's not an enforcement element. But I do think it's important for us to recognize that uh, when, as we demand rights, that we also recognize we have responsibilities that go along with them. Uh, and sometimes we don't often remember that part. Sure. <coughs> So my colleagues Dennis and Santosh are now going to take you through an activity. Uh, we are looking at uh, banding up the audience into groups of four or five. Um, so maybe we could have a random selection. I could just, I mean, if you move ahead. Go, go, ahead. go ahead. So one, two, three, four, five, you could come this way. Uh, Five people per group is should be fine, right? Yeah. I think there are there are enough people in the audience. So it, it takes it takes twenty minutes. Just some people <laughs> are leaving yeah. because some they have to leave. But it, it's okay. it takes about twenty minutes and it's gonna yeah. be a discussion within the group and you get to know new people hopefully. Um, Sorry? Yeah. You have another obligation, you can go More. ahead. No, that's fine. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. But for those who are remaining, yeah, yeah. it's going to be only 20 minutes in that group, uh, and you get to know your group mates, and that's a great thing, and we'll come back together and everything. Okay, then we'll pass you also. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. This group is larger. So three groups. You all could maybe come in closer if that's... Yes. So... One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So you move actually that way with them, and you come in closer. Thank you for staying.
Yes. So, um, we're now going to start the, the group phase. It's about 20 minutes. Um, we'll have one group online. Everyone who's online, uh, after we gave instructions, please um, go to the breakout um, room. I think, if I'm correct, we're going to have a breakout room for you created, correct? We'll take lead here. And um, for everyone else, the idea for today is to um, have a look at the charter. This is the charter that we have brought, unfortunately only in a very bad copy. It's the English version, obviously, with other translations. Um, but the idea is to um, pick one of the articles, which is relating to one or several rights and principles, one of the articles of the charter as a group, and to think about the challenges that this article and the associated right and principle will face in the next 10 years. So think about the, the most horrible technological developments, political developments that can occur, and think about this in the first step. And then think in the second step about what the Global Digital, digital Compact could do in order to help um, lower the risk in order to help address the challenge that you have defined or the challenges that you have defined um, for the article that you're focusing on. So there are three steps essentially. I mean, first, get to know each other, introduce uh, yourselves to each other, then pick an article, think about challenges in the next 10 years, and then uh, think about what you think the international community um, through the Global Digital Compact could do. What should be entailed? What should come out at the Summit of the Future in New York 2024 that would help against those challenges. Are there any questions, either here in the room or online? And afterward, we'll come together and we'll quickly discuss what you have come up with and have an overall discussion. Any questions here in the room? No? Then you have 20 minutes. Um, go. Hi, everyone. So. I um, unfortunately, hi, um, so your five minutes are up, maybe give you another two minutes, and I'm going to time it this time, yeah? Can, can we have group one uh, starting, please? I do believe, who's group one, Santosh? You are group one. Yes. <laughs> yes, so we look forward to getting your inputs. Yeah, and please, uh, please introduce yourself, and uh, if you could also talk a little bit about your group, what you discussed, and... Okay, yes, I'll so. start by noting that we could not agree on who we report, so we'd pick two of us. <laughs> we spoke about the freedom of expression, because that was the most obviously under threat all the time. Noting a uh, long time there's been a debate about whether or how it applies online. There have been some people who agree, think that it should not be, it's somehow different online. And of course, there are differences in the scale and speed and so on. But uh, in the principle should be the same. Exactly why uh, it has been argued it's different and how it should be interpreted online. That was part of why the charter actually was started. To how does this apply online from human rights? Okay, maybe I'll hand over to you from this point. Okay, so uh, the 
things that we were discussing in our group is that, of course, that freedom of info, uh, freedom of expression, and is one of the most essential rights uh, in terms of both in offline world and in the online world. But at the same point of time, we know like every rights come up with certain restrictions. No right is an uh, no right is an absolute right. Now in the offline world, you know there were better ways to stop hate speech. So. If somebody says which is uh, hate speech or uh, makes some comments which are you know which might provoke uh, violence against a particular community, it could be curbed in a better way. Now, with the speed and scale in the online world, we see that you know the spread of misinformation and disinformation, and coming from South Asia and coming from global South, we have seen in Myanmar, in Bangladesh, even in my own country, that okay, somebody writes uh, a hateful. Uh, post against a minority group, against some indigenous group, it spreads and even the real physical loss of life takes place. So when we talk about freedom of expression uh, in uh, online world, we also have to be cautious about you know uh, how to protect uh, and stop the dissemination of misinformation as well. This also means that you know uh, there should be regulations in that term, but we should also be mindful uh, as civil society that the governments are not going overboard with those regulations in terms of uh, principles of legitimacy, necessity, and proportionality are followed. And uh, in uh, like uh, the government should not use this particular thing to you know the curb the actual uh, uh, application of the rights. So uh, the things like national security and uh, curbing the spread of misinformation should not be used to curtail the rightful expression. So not all opinions can be labeled as misinformation. Of course, the facts are there. We can differ. And so we can't say that all the opinions are misinformation. But we need to also find and devise you know, ways so that, OK, these are the responsibility of states, and these are the responsibility of businesses. And as responsible uh, uh, stakeholders in the online environment, these are our responsibilities. So. I'm not saying that the freedom of expression differs in online and offline world. It's just that the speed and scale makes it much more difficult to control the spread of disinformation and misinformation. And that can actually result in loss of life uh, in, uh, and serious harm to certain communities. Thank you. It's the final comment. We did not solve all the problems, even though we talked about them. <laughs> Okay, can, can we have group two now? Group two? <laughs> yes. And you can int please introduce yourself. Yeah. And um, I'm Isuru from uh, Lanesia. So uh, this is my group, and so I'm just uh, voicing out what we discuss. Uh, so we picked uh, Article 13, which is about uh, rights uh, of uh, persons with disabilities and how this can be a challenge or, you know, uh, how it will be like in the future. That's what's our discussion. And uh, so uh, our idea was that uh, technology is getting better and better inclusive, so some of issues it might uh, solve in the future, definitely. Uh, but we saw some, you know, gaps in in uh, in uh, areas like with if you take persons with hearing impaired, where you need like a lot of technological involvement, and also if you take like sign language is not kind of a universal language that you find. So there are like uh, regional variations and language variations and all that. So how do you make internet accessible for them is going to be a challenge, uh, though. You have all those technological developments, AI helping you to read your lips and you know, and turning it into a sign languages and all that. Um, so uh, the other point we discuss is that you need to have uh, inclusion by design, so we can make you know uh, all our designs inclusive, and we can like provide uh, uh, like comments on whatever the the things uh, like you know, the developments out there and make those, and compel them to make those uh, inclusive. And also uh, getting community engagement and empowerment is also going to be really important because uh, if you take uh, uh, 
uh, persons with disabilities, they have always problems of like raising their voices uh, because of the system that the majority that follows, like you have, sometimes you have to, uh, for example, like for a certain comments, you might have to submit written comments or like you might have to go to a place, go to a building and to, to give your comments. So those things might restrict some of uh, uh, persons with disabilities, like uh, raising their voice, so so then you need to uh, uh, avoid those things and uh, find a way to get their comments on those things as well. Uh, and yes, did I miss anything? <laughs> okay, then thank you. Right. Thank you so much for your comments. Now we have last but not the least, Group Three. So hello everyone, I'm from Nepal and my name is Dakal Asuk and uh, we are the last group here and we have talked about uh, rights to children and the internet and we're going to, uh, I'm going to present our conclusion here. So first of all, uh, I like to say that the children are the future of our nation and uh, whatever rights we uh, give them today, it uh, brings our uh, nation uh, in, uh, like uh, uh, what uh, brings our nation in, into 10 years uh, is uh, depend upon the rights given today to our children. So we uh, there, uh, there might be lots of kind, lots of uh, rights th the children should be exercised, but we uh, should filter them. Like uh, there's, uh, there's uh, should be a, a strong filtering system while giving and giving them rights and exercising the rights. The, uh, like the rights from the internet, like uh, we have given them a proper right to use the internet in the studies, and we have given them the rights, uh, including the, their freedom of expression and freedom association. But while giving such kind of right uh, uh, today, it might benefit them for the uh, uh, short term basis only. But, uh, uh, but in the future, it can go darker and darker. Uh, if it is not regulated in the right way. Uh, for example, we can see that the generative AI, like the ChatGPT, uh, the children are using right now, it is uh, becoming uh, strong and strong, and it is, uh, we can see that it is becoming dangerous for the children. Uh, so if, uh, we c if, if we, c we do not give this kind of right to children, then they say the, the, the st students are not getting their right. And if, if we give this kind of right to them, and then uh, their cognitive ability might uh, get uh, destroyed in maybe uh, five or ten years, and they might uh, fully depend on the uh, kind of the AI. So uh, they, there are both the positive and negative aspect of the uh, giving rights to the children. But uh, what we should, uh, what the government should is, um, what they are giving to their children and. Uh, uh, what the future of the, uh, what the consequences will it bring? So uh, as always, we have talked about freedom from exploitation and child abuse. Uh, like uh, in our society, in our school, in our college, in our country, we can see that uh, uh, there, uh, the, there is a strong rule which protects children from exploitation and abuse imagery. But uh, in the online, online area or in the online internet, uh, no, it is not, uh, they are not protected um, safely or they are, ex they are exploited more on internet than in the physical uh, environment or uh, the, so the, uh, while giving the freedom from exploration in uh, child imag imaginary, it is effective uh, for in the physical concept only, but uh, in, the, um, uh, in the virtual world, uh, it is not so strong. Uh, this, uh, they can, they might not g uh, get, pro you know, the time to exercise its right. So uh, while uh, the government body or any organization uh, try to exercise the freedom from e exploitation in child abuse imaginary, they should be more specific on the internet aspect, uh, like. Uh, Banning, uh, the, like banning only the uh, 
uh, website or uh, some kind of activities will not uh, will not eff effective. There should be a strong mechanism. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comments. And now Dennis will ask the uh, online yes, participants. I'm, I'm uh, already asked a question in chat. Just now, once again, last opportunity. If you want to weigh in from online, please um, raise your hand, I think. If that's not the case, I think we can hand back to you, Rashi, for a last round of comments. Okay, so maybe we start with you. You want to start with me? Sure, I can start. I thought with comments from everyone. I mean, there's no many things have been said. We haven't really yeah. talked, I think, about the global digital compact in the solutions uh, phase so much. But if someone wants to bring it back to that, that's the original thought yeah, of I the discussion. But I mean, yeah, take it from here. Sorry. That is true. Is there anyone who wants to or has a counter argument? Uh, do you want to go on top or do you want the mic? You can. Yeah, go ahead. My name is Tomoe. I am based in Tallinn, Estonia. I'm from the Tallinn University. And um, I think th the it's interesting that uh, none of the group uh, came up with the solution was the DDC. And that is maybe telling someone <laughs> something about uh, the impact of the DDC on the international human rights law perspective. I think uh, the lady spoke about the human rights uh, mentioning in the text, but how concretely we can talk about the rights and the legal legality connected arguments through the GDC. I think that's maybe a fit question. Thank you. Thanks so much. Is there anyone else who has any rebuttals, uh, solutions, comments, uh, maybe comments about what another group said, agreeing, disagreeing? There is someone from online? Yeah, hi. Can I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead. OK, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Veronica Panay. Um, I'm currently a student at the Tel Aviv University. Um, it's really interesting. I think in my group, we, did, we really didn't have like a lot of time to have a conversation. Um, but we focused on the right the access to the internet um, I know that we're asked to identify some of the challenges and um, I spoke from a home perspective so I'm from Nigeria and one of the issues that although we have that right um, for me I'm saying that what we what we've experienced in our country is where we've seen instances where government infringes on those rights so an, an instance I gave was when the Nigerian government shut down access to Twitter in the country at that time, which is currently X. And although we have the right to access the internet, we could see that the government could impeach on those rights. And other African countries have experienced, and other countries even have experienced internet shutdowns, and that is critical. So even if the, the article states that we have the right to access the internet, and everybody knows that, from my own perspective, I'm seeing that when we don't have this passed into legislation, in the country that we're in, I'll speak for my country, Nigeria, when we don't have this legislation, it's very, very difficult for enforcement purposes. So, I mean, one of the solutions that I, I mean I speak of is having the laws passed in the country that reflects these principles. Because what we have um, this right stated, like, in our constitution, and with the new interactions with technology, um, it's difficult to, like, enforce. So it's always good to pass as in have rights or legislation in the country that passed that. Um, another um, way that the Nigerian uh, nonprofit sector and you know people who are digital rights advocates have been able to like bypass this, have been to use strategic litigation to challenge like the government in instances of breach of certain digital rights. Um, so for us, that has been like a creative way of using present laws, um, I'll give instance like right to privacy, right to have access to information, and using those rights to go to the courts to challenge those rights. I mean, I hope I've been able to make a contribution. Um, thank you very much. 
Thank you so much for your inputs. You were great. Uh, is there anyone else online that would like to give their inputs? And if not, a anyone here? Who wants if not, I will uh, uh, yes, give it back to the speakers. Yes. Well, before I speak, well, just to wait uh, to continue the discussion from where she has started about the uh, why we only discuss about the challenges and why there was no discussion about the uh, solutions and what would be the role of the G uh, Global Digital Compact in designing the solution. So just wanted to know uh, in your research, Dennis, you asked about who should be responsible, which stakeholders should be responsible for framing the GDC or how uh, how effective they are in uh, what role they have in framing the GDC. But uh, maybe one question in the Global South or all over, we have to ask how involved the stakeholders in different levels are in this uh, Global Digital Compact uh, designing process. Uh, it is started in September 2021, and now we are in October 2023, two years has gone. And they plan to, UN plans to adopt it by the future of the uh, future summit in 2000, September 2024. So we have almost uh, 11 months or one year in our hand. Uh, but looking at the kind of discourse in uh, South Asia or the developing countries, there is no discussion about the global, global digital compact. Even the government, uh, they don't know about it. Stakeholders, civil society, media, they do not know about it. UN organization, they are not talking about the global digital compact. So, what would be the what would be the? It would be another charter or another compact. Without we are talking about the multilateralism, multi-stakeholderism, and participation of all stakeholders. But if we, if the compact is coming like this without uh, proper consultation or even stakeholder not knowing about you, but not knowing about it in the larger framework, so what kind of impact it will have. And the second question is about the enforceability uh, that uh, earlier Pahlani mentioned of. Uh, we have, for example, this uh, business and human rights uh, guidelines by the UN, and that is normative framework. So what would be the kind of status of this global digital compact and how it would be enforced and what would be the role of different uh, stakeholder in this whole process? If we uh, look at the compact from that perspective, maybe we can uh, have some roles into it, different stakeholders can have roles, some roles into it, and we can devise, a, uh, design it in a manner that it would be helpful to address the challenges uh, on different human rights on online space that we are discussing now. Quick comment. I mean, I think as much as we find fault with it, it has made a lot of effort for consultation. Uh, so I kind of, you know, agree and I'm kind of disagreeing with you. Uh, but consultation processes, even at a national level, are completely imperfect processes, right? The privileged participate the knowledgeable people participate. We've done what water, you know, on infrastructure. That's the nature of consultations. Large amounts of money have been spent. This was a global consultation, uh, and I thought it was much more consultative than many other global processes. Actually, right? They ha did make the effort. It's never going to be perfect. The only way for it to make it perfect is to run national level elections on whether we agree. Uh, on you know some of the articles in there. So I think it is by definition going to be imperfect. And I think it's still ongoing, so meaning the official consultations are over, but there's still a lot of opportunity to influence. And to me, the sign that there are at least three sessions here at the IGF itself. Um, and for example, I told you the one organized by somebody else, but I happen to be a speaker. All the ambassadors from the host, from the countries that are, you know, hosting this Germany, Kenya, and I forget whichever other one, and Amandeep Kiel came, came. So there was somebody in the room all the time. So at least there's the theater of listening, right? Um, I don't know what actual influence. So I think I'm just trying to say something, you know, very positive about this because in an imperfect situation, and I think the global mechanisms for actually enforcement are quite tough because we don't all live in the EU because there, where there's some common understanding and structure 
where, yes, there's some room for countries to wiggle around once the common framework is set. We don't live anywhere in that world, right? So it's really the next step is, even if we end up with a perfect GTC document, is, f I think, at ground level for people like us to make sure that then our nations develop policies that are at least reflective and aligned with that, I think. Right. Definitely. So now we're running out of time, so Dennis is going to close the session for that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for coming. I think this was um, um, very good to communicate not, all, not only all activities, but be starting a discussion on how uh, articles of the chart are still relevant, um, also today and in the next 10 years. Um, we do have, obviously, English and uh, Japanese versions of the 10 principles. Take one, take two, take three. Uh, bring them to your friends who might be interested in this. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And also online, thank you. <laughs>